20 years ago, the Beatles invaded America, and nothing's been the same since. Believe in Yesterday, a five-part special report. See it tonight at 8.30 Eastern on CNN. Well, 20 years ago today, an invasion force was pre preparing to attack America. The force was a small one, just four young men, but the weapon was powerful, rock and roll music. Sandy Kenyon reports in this, the first of a special series on CNN this week. It's called Beatlemania, Believe in Yesterday. The Beatles! By the time the Beatles shook hands with Ed Sullivan on that February 9th, 20 years ago, America was in the firm grip of Beatlemania. In England, the Beatles were already big stars. Well, I saw her, yeah, In December 1963, a couple of weeks before Capitol Records planned to release I Want to Hold Your Hand in the United States, DJ Carol James had a copy flown over from London. We put it on the turntable in the music library first and listened to it, and maybe five or six standing around, and, and the group grew as the record continued to play. And people said, well, what do you think? And I said, I don't know. It's an interesting record, but who knows if it's going to go in the United States? Executives at Capitol Records were forced to move up the U.S. release date for I Want to Hold Your Hand due to the sheer demand for the song. On January 25th, it was racing up the Billboard record charts, and one week later, it reached number one, where it stayed for seven weeks. The Beatles' first American tour took John, Paul, George, and Ringo across the country in 15 days. But the Beatles weren't ready for the reception they got. Peter Brown, who helped manage the Beatles and co-wrote the best-selling book about the group called The Love You Make, explains. The reception that was waiting for them, which was totally unexpected by us, I mean, we didn't know what to expect. It was like coming to, to Mecca. I mean, it was heaven. It was wonderful. All these DJs, all these uh, the, the re wonderful radio stations, the fact that we, they should be received in this manner as if it was like a visiting head of state and everyone was crazy in the Sullivan show. And it was just, that's when I think they first realized that they had really broken something major. Bruce Morrow, better known to his fans as Cousin Brucey from WABC Radio in New York, was one of those DJs who helped promote Beatlemania. The first press conference, the first Beatle press conference at the Pan American uh, Lounge, which was hurriedly put together, they were very scared. They came across as wise guys, but it wasn't that they were wise guys. They were just very, very frightened four lads because even though they enjoyed a, mod a modicum of success in Europe, nothing on the scale that was happening right here in this nation. It was an unbelievable situation. All hell broke loose at the airport. I mean, there were thousands of teeny bop kids, mostly girls, of course. And then uh, the press. There was almost as much press down there that day as there was kids at the airport waiting for them. The scene was the same at every stop. Screaming fans, reporters, and then the climax. A concert best described as an orderly riot. Here's how a WGN reporter at the time described the scene at the Chicago Amphitheater. It's wild! This place has gone out of its head! You have never heard anything like this in your life! It's absolutely wild! Faced with reporters always asking the same questions, the members of the group developed a unique way of responding. Humor mixed with sarcasm so the journalists never quite knew when the Beatles were poking fun at them. Who came up with the name Beatles, and what does it really mean? John thought of the name Beatles, and he'll tell you about it now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, just, it means Beatles, isn't it? You know, if that's just a name, you know, like shoe. Like shoe. The shoes. 
You see, we could have been called the shoes for all you know. Others might have been considered rude, but to their fans, the Beatles were cute. Perhaps that's because their ribbing always showed signs of real intellect. Consider this scene from their first movie, A Hard Day's Night, made just a few months after their first U.S. tour. Tell me, uh, how did you find America? Turn up to Greenland. Has success changed your life? Yes. I'd like to keep Britain tidy. Are you a mod or a rocker? Um, no, I'm a mocker. <laughs> so what would you call that uh, hairstyle you're wearing? Arthur. If the Beatles satirized the press, they also poked fun at the screaming fans that followed them everywhere. Don't move any of you. They've gone potty out there. The place is surging with girls. Please, sir, sir, can I have one to surgery, sir, please, sir? No, you can't. Now, listen, as soon as I tell you, get out through this door here into that big car that's waiting. <laughs> Smirking yet lovable attitude became an early trademark, helped establish their personalities, and ultimately helped sell millions of records. Tomorrow, a look at how the Beatles changed both the music industry and American culture with concept albums, mop top haircuts, and Beatles lunchboxes. For now, this is Sandy Kenyon, CNN, Hollywood. 20 years ago, the Beatles landed in New York. In part two of our series, Beatlemania, Believe in Yesterday, CNN Sandy Kenyon reports on how the Beatles changed the music and culture of America. The sound was new, and so was the way it was promoted. The selling of the Beatles was almost as important as the music itself. Within hours of their arrival in New York, there were Beatle t-shirts, followed by Beatle buttons, sneakers, combs, purses, and of course, those Beatle wigs. Inevitably, other musical acts tried to look and sound like the Beatles. Some even poked fun at them. Much of the credit for the Beatles' impact on the world belongs to their manager, Brian Epstein. One of his former associates, Peter Brown, calls Epstein a brilliant promoter. It was his dreams that filled those football stadiums and the, uh, the closed circuit, uh, the, the satellite, international satellite, which is the first time anyone had done international satellite, was the Beatles. All of these things were Brian's vision. That vision produced hundreds of different Beatles products, products that have since become expensive collector's items. Mark Lapidus makes his living sponsoring Beatle Fests for thousands of fans. In 1974, he visited John Lennon in New York to ask what the former Beatle thought of the whole idea. I sat down and told John my whole idea, and he said, quote, I'm all for it, I'm a Beatles fan too. And from that moment on, uh, John helped, helped turn Beatle Fest from a dream into reality. But there was more to the Beatles phenomenon than just hype. When they showed up on stage at places like the Hollywood Bowl, they delivered the goods an exciting show which became an event. And so they managed to fulfill the enormous expectations of their fans. Promoter, Jim Rissmiller. Uh, they wanted the unheard of sum at that time, $25,000 flat, which was twice as much as any major American star at the time was getting. And so it was very risky and questionable, but uh, the, the, the disc jockey that we knew, Bob Eubanks, and myself and Steve Wolf, we all collaborated on that. Eubanks uh, had some collateral, we borrowed some money at the bank. And we did the show, sold out in four hours, and we made more money than the Beatles did. 